So we are continuing our study through the Kings. So uh, we're uh, getting pretty close. Uh, we're not close to the end, but we're getting close, closer to the end of the, the Kings of Israel, the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And I just want to give a recap of where we, we've come from. I mean, obviously we have uh, the first king of Israel of all the entire uh, Israel uh, was Saul. And so Saul reigned for 40 years. And then David, took after, after Saul died, took his place and reigned for 40 years. And then Solomon reigned for 40 years. So those are pretty easy because there's three kings that reigned over all of Israel, all 12 tribes. And that's Saul, David, and Solomon. They all reigned each for 40 years. But then at the end of Solomon's reign, the kingdom split. So we have the northern kingdom of Israel that took the ten tribes up there. And then you have the southern kingdom that had Judah and also Benjamin's included there as well. Uh, but, but we had that split. And what we've been doing is going through the northern kingdom of Israel. We're getting all the, the, the wicked guys out first. And then we'll go to Judah uh, and, and go through those kings. But basically what we have is that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he's the first king that takes over that northern kingdom, and he reigns for 22 years. His son Nadab only reigns for two years. Then Nadab is killed, and Baasha reigns for 24 years. Then Elah, his son, only reigns for two years, and then he's killed by Zimri. So basically, you kind of have those things repeating themselves. Jeroboam, you know, reigns for a good little bit of time. His son, taken out early. Then you have Baasha, who took out Elah. He reigns for, for a good little time. Then his son dies early. And then Zimri only reigns for seven days. He's the one that burns the palace over top of him. And basically that uh, burn the house down mentality uh, of Zimri. Then Omri, the captain of the host, takes over that northern kingdom of Israel. He reigns for 12 years. And then Ahab, his son, reigns for 22 years. And I did a whole sermon last week on Ahab. And so he's one of the, the prevalent kings because when you're dealing with Elijah and all that stuff, that's during Ahab's reign. And then uh, what we're going to get into tonight is Ahaziah and Jehoram. And you may not have known this, but they're not, it's not Ahaziah then his son Jehoram reign. These are brothers. So Ahaziah is going to reign. It's Ahab's son. But then Jehoram's going to reign because, and we'll see that, uh, he takes the place of his brother. Okay, so that's kind of one of those interesting cases where it's not a son taking over after him. And so I want you to go back to 1 Kings chapter 22 because this is where we see Ahaziah introduced. And Ahaziah, he only reigns for two years. So he doesn't reign very long. There's not a whole lot mentioned about Ahaziah, but there's some interesting stuff uh, dealing with Ahaziah here. Um, but in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 22, we see in verse 51, verse 51, it says, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. So if you remember Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, what was his big sin? He made the two calves, right? He put one in Bethel, he put one in Dan. And that's the sin that keeps being brought up. They did the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, son of Nebat. You know, and it keeps going through this Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam. Well, that's what it's talking about. They still had those calves in Bethel and Dan. And so this sin is still going on. But not only did he follow that, but he followed the ways of his father and his mother, Jezebel. So Isaiah's mother is Jezebel. And so we see that, remember Omri says that he did more wickedly than all the kings before him? Then Ahab comes on the scene and says he did more wickedly than all the kings before him. So they keep trumping each other, right, as far as how bad they are. Well, Ahaziah, he's pretty much just like Papa. He just does exactly like his father and his mother and still has the sins of Jeroboam son Nebat. Now, what's interesting about Ahaziah, or basically, uh, we're going to get into this with Jehoshaphat, but Jehoshaphat yokes up with Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. So he yokes up with all the kings of Israel of his time because Jehoshaphat's going to be alive and reigning through those three kings and every time he gets rebuked for it. <laughs> okay, so go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I want you to see this because I just want you to see something else that's mentioned with Ahaziah because there's just not a lot uh, dealing with him. Obviously, the chapter we read here in, in 2 Kings chapter 1 is dealing with him. 
But a lot of the stuff that we're going to be going through tonight is more so dealing with Jehoram, his brother. Got back from soul winning just in time. <laughs> so in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 35, it says, After this did Jehoshaphat king of Judah join himself with Ahaziah king of Israel, who did very wickedly. So we get a little more information about Ahaziah, right? We, we obviously see that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but it says that he did very wickedly. It says, verse 36, And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made the ships in ezion Geber. Now this is in- interesting because basically he's yoking up. Remember he yoked up with Ahab, and that's where you had that infamous line, uh, uh, you know, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. That's where Jehu, the son of Hanani, comes to Jehoshaphat after he just helped Ahab. Then what does he do? Well, his son comes into the rain, and he's helping him out and yoking up with him to make these ships. Well, look what happens here in verse 37. It says, Then Eliezer, the son of Dodava of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works, and the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. So it's just a little cool story, just dealing with the fact that he made these ships with Ahaziah, and God just broke them. So I don't know if he just, like, basically there's a big hurricane that came by and these ships were just tossed all over the place and broken in half. But uh, we see that Josh Fat is getting grilled every time he helps out another king. You know, or it basically helps out the king of Israel. Uh, but go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 there. And that's the chapter we read before we started here. <clears throat> and this chapter is dealing with Moab. Moab is rebelling against Israel, and basically they find out Ahab dies, and then they're like, all right, we're going to go after him now. But notice what it says here in first, or Second Kings chapter 1, in verse 1. It says, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, and Ahaziah, or I'm sorry, and, and was sick. And he sent messengers and sent unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So what's going on here? Ahaziah falls through a lattice, and then he gets sick. Okay, so I don't know, you know, it's just one of those interesting things where, where you're just like, how does that happen? And it's just kind of this, this weird event where this king falls through a lattice in his upper chamber. So I don't know what that is. When I think of a lattice, I think of like basically a porch with lattice underneath of it. It's all just show. Does that make sense? It's, uh, and I'm an engineer, but I'm not an architect. Okay, so these, these fancy words like clear story and, and rotundas and cupolas and all these different things, they have all these, these, these words for like different types of things. Um, I know a beam, a column, and, you know, foundations and all that stuff. You know, I'm pretty simple when it comes to that type of stuff. But anyway, um, a lattice, I think of something that's decorative that's not structural. Okay, so basically I think what happened here is that he had a balcony and there was lattice, meaning like there was uh, something that was for show, it was for looks that was like to down below, and he fell through that. It could have just felt, said he fell off the balcony or fell off the upper chamber, but it's make, basically saying he fell through some things as he went down, right? There was like this, this architectural like lattice that he like busted through when he went through uh, when he fell off this, this top chamber there. And so just kind of giving you an idea of what that looked like, basically just seeing this guy fall through some lattice going down and hitting the ground. But it's interesting because he, then he gets sick. So I'm not sure what caused the sickness, you know, if it was just... But it's kind of like, is that related? Uh, oh, by the way, he got sick after that, and that's what killed him, you know. Um, but I guess, it, you know, you can get sick. If you get injured, you can end up getting sick, and then that sickness can take you out kind of thing. So I don't know if he got an infection... You never know. It doesn't really tell us exactly what happened uh, or why he got sick. Um, but, but anyway, he gets sick. And then he, what he does is he's sending messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether he'll recover. Now remember in chapter 22 of 1 Kings, who did he worship? Baal, the god of Ekron, right? Well, here it calls him Beelzebub. Does that sound familiar? Baal Zabub. So you see here it's spelled B A A L Z E B U B. 
And this sounds familiar to something in the New Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Because every, every uh, major uh, civilization back then had, like, their god. Right? They have gods, but they have, like, the god. You think of, like, Greeks, they had Zeus, and then what was the Romans, like, Apollos or something like that. So they all had, like, their king of gods kind of thing. Does that make sense? They had all these different gods, but then they had, like, the king, like, the one that was above them all. And in all these different uh, religions, when you go back in here, we see, you know, we look at Babylon, what's their number one god? Bell. Bell. And, well, that kind of makes sense. Bell's above. Baal's above. And Baal was, like, a big one, you know, for Ekron, for the Philistines and all that stuff. And it's like their chief god. Does that make sense? And you wonder where, like, these terms come from as far as who the devil is, okay? Um, and it really comes down to this. Everybody's chief god of these other religions is the devil. Okay, that's pretty much what it comes down to. It all comes back to they're worshiping Satan. Okay, and so in Matthew chapter 12, I want you to see that Baal's, uh, it says Beelzebub. That's what we, we, we say it in the New Testament, Beelzebub. Um, in chapter 12, verse 22, it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is, it not, this, is, is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince, of the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Amen. So notice that he's using this synonymously where he's saying Satan cast out Satan or Beelzebub cast out devils. So who's Beelzebub? Satan. He is the devil. And so, uh, you know, when you're dealing with this Beelzebub in the Old Testament, what are you dealing with? The old, you're dealing with the devil. They are worshiping the devil. Okay? Whether ignorantly or knowingly, they are. And it comes down to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You think of like the Hinduism, where they worship all these other gods. They're all worshiping devils. You say, well, it's just an inanimate object. Yeah, it is an inanimate, uh, inanimate oh, good night, I can't even talk, inanimate object. But they are, there is a spiritual aspect to that. They are worshiping a devil, or the devil in a lot of cases. Okay? In a lot of cases, it's ignorance, but sometimes it's not. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 19, it says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would that, they, that ye should have fellowship, or that, I'm sorry, I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. So notice what it's saying here. He's saying that, you know, is the idol anything? It's a rhetorical question. It's not anything. Basically, he's saying, you know, and he's talking about eating meats and all this stuff. He's basically saying, the idol's nothing. We know that. We know it's made with man's hands. You know, it's dumb. It can't speak. It can't breathe. But they're sacrificing the devils when they do it. So the spiritual element to that is that that's why idolatry is so wicked because they're literally worshiping devils when they're worshiping these images. Okay? Even though it's just this wooden object that's plated with gold, right, that's made from the earth, there's a spiritual aspect is that it's the devils. So I just think that's interesting. When I read through 2 Kings, I always see that with Beelzebub, and I'm like, oh, it's Beelzebub. So you wonder where that phrase come from, came from in the New Testament, why they're like, you know, he's casting out devils by Beelzebub. 2 Kings chapter 1 shows us that they knew of this name of Beelzebub, Beelzebub. And you say, why is it Beelzebub? Well, first of all, it could just be because it's coming from a Greek transliteration instead of from a Hebrew transliteration. But how about Beelzebub? You know, the, the Babylonian bell. Back here, we're dealing with, what, you're dealing with Moab, and you're dealing with Ekron, and you're dealing with these other nations. They had, like, a different name for it. But Babylon's pretty much the last kingdom to take them out in that whole captivity, and their major god was Bel. So it makes sense that they would be like Beelzebub. And... 
I didn't look at the whole etymology of it, but maybe the zabub is basically saying the prince of it. You know, like there's, ba there's Baal and Baalim, which is, means many gods, right? But then there's Beelzebub, which is the prince of them. So basically you have devils, but then you have the devil. You have, you know, and it, it, you know I didn't want to go into a whole sermon on that, but I just think that's interesting when you read through that passage. But going back to 2 Kings chapter 1 there, 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 3, Elijah comes on the scene here, and Elijah, he basically gets to these messengers before they even get to him. Like, he knows they're coming, all this stuff, and <clears throat> notice that he's going to tell these messengers that he's not going to recover from this sickness, okay? So that's what he's, he's trying to inquire of Baal, and basically, you know, Elijah steps in there and says, why are you doing that, you know? Is there not a God in Israel, right? And verse 3 there, it says, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the, the king that sent, sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baals above, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a, with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it, it, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So, you know, they basically, they, the messengers bring back that message. And he's saying, what, do you look, you know, what does the guy look like? And I love that it's just like, he's just a hairy guy. <laughs> you know, like that's the number one attribute that you see about this guy. But, uh, but you know what? I just think of uh, men of God in the Bible and, you know, I, 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 you just say, why are you parking on this? You know, I hit this subject. I'm like, listen, every hair-legged man out there, you know, that believes the Bible or that's just a hair-legged, red-blooded American will say that, like, pedophilia is wicked as hell. And I've heard people will be like, well, you know, that's, you know, you're so, you're, you're like against people that don't have, that aren't hairy. Listen, when I say that, I'm talking about people that shave their legs, okay? People that, like, that actually want to, like, get rid of their hair. Does that make sense? Like, obviously, if you can't, you know, you're like, oh, there's Asian people out there. They can't do that. It's like, it's not what I'm talking about. And people take that stuff. I'm just like, really? That's what you got out of what I said there? You know, they're just nitpicking. They just got triggered. And when I see this passage where it says, I saw a hairy man, I just see people triggering, like, oh, you know, like, Amen. does that mean he's manly? You know, like, does that define manliness? You know, it's like, that's not the point. But, you know, you just say things like that because the whole point is, is that men are supposed to be, you know, a little rough around the edges. Does that make sense? That's all I'm getting at with that is that we're supposed to be rough around the edges. When I see Elijah and I see Elisha, I see men that are rough around the edges. They're not prim and proper on everything that they do, you know. And you get into this realm of like, oh, we need to be clean cut, no beards. And I've heard that, you know. And listen, I would grow a better beard, but I just can't, Okay. So I'm just going to go with the 5 o'clock shadow, and so I don't look like a child. But, <laughs> but all I can say is that, you know, when it comes to men, we need to be manly. We need to not dress like girls. Amen. You know, wear pants that fit. You know, you don't have to be stylish and trendy and all this other stuff. And anyway, I know I'm getting off on a tangent with that, but when I see this with Elijah, Elijah is one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. I mean, you think about it. I mean, Elijah is the one that's going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. John the Baptist is Elijah, which was for to come, you know, and Elijah is a great Bible character. But when it says, well, you know, who is this man? What did he look like? He was a hairy man, and he had this leather girdle about him, you know. It's just like, he's basically this hairy man with his big belt, you know. And that screams masculinity, masculinity. And in today's society, it's like, that's toxic. You know, Gillette told me that, you know, we we're not supposed to be that manly. Well, the hell with Gillette. You know what? I haven't shaved in like two years, and I don't plan on doing it with Gillette's anyway. But, you know, when it comes to this, you know, all I'm getting at with this 
is that we need to be manly in the day we live in today. And, you know, any, any time before this, I bet people were reading this and thinking, like, yeah, it makes sense. He's, he's a guy, right? Nowadays, you read this and you say, well, he's a hairy man, and people just get triggered, Amen. you know. So uh, we have just this really weak society as it is when it comes to men anymore. Um, okay, what does that have to do with Ahaziah? Nothing besides the fact that he asked, <laughs> you know, and he knew it's kind of like if you knew, like if you said this guy's a hairy man, you're like, that's Elijah, right? That's like your defining attribute, right? And so, you know, you kind of think about how you would like say, well, you know, who'd you see? And then they said something about you. What would be that defining feature about you Amen. that, you know, wisp eat? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, but all I'm saying is that it's just interesting how they know who it is just based off some like physical feature like that. So and it just tells me that Elijah was not a trendy like, uh, you know, hipster, like, like the today when we're dealing with, you know, the, the, the purple light the atmosphere of the churches today, that's not who Elijah was. Amen. Elijah was a manly man. Anyway, so going on from that, uh, going in verse 9 there, this is a very famous story. And what I want you to get out with this, because we're going through Ahaziah, is that this story of Eli- Elijah calling down fire and consuming people happened to Ahaziah's men. Okay? So, this is a famous story. This is different than when on Count, uh, Mount Carmel, where uh, he, he destroys all the prophets of Baal, and that the fire is called down, and they consume the sacrifice. This is where Elijah calls down fire from heaven and consumes people, consumes men. But it happened to Ahaziah's men. Okay? So, uh, going in verse 9 there, it says, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him. Behold, he sat on the top of the oven hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now, I was just preaching about the apostles and basically why were they doing these miracles and all that is to prove that they are true apostles, right? That was the, the reasoning for a lot of these signs and wonders and miracles that they were doing. And what is Elijah saying here? If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven. And guess what happened? Fire came down from heaven. You know what that did? That validated that he was a man of God. And in verse 11 there it says, Again, also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty, and he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. Now, think about this. He sends another 50. Just think about how he's not thinking this through. Like, um, do you realize what just happened to your last 50 men? Right? And then it says in verse 12, And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 and his 50. Ahaziah is just not getting it. Does that make sense? Like, it's just like he's just, it's not registering here. Like, this is not a good idea. But notice the captain of this third 50 here. It says, And the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. So notice how he's coming up. He's not saying, come down. He's saying, please don't kill us. Right, it's pretty much he's just like, I know what just happened, and don't kill us, right? And verse 14 there, it says, Behold, there came, uh, I'm sorry, did I read that here, right? Yeah. Be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire from heaven and burn up the two captains of the former fifties and their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire Baals above, the God of Ekron, is it not because there is not a God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he didn't trim his message, did he? Right? After all this, he just basically says the same exact thing he said from the very beginning. And... You know, it, I don't know if this is the, the reason that he didn't recover is because he inquired of Beelzebub. 
It so- kind of sounds like it. It doesn't explicitly say that, but I have a feeling that if you wouldn't have tried to inquire of Beelzebub, he may have actually recovered of that sickness. But I think that that was like the, the catalyst to basically take him out. And so, uh, but it's interesting with that story, because this is actually that story of Elijah calling down fire is in the New Testament. Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Or it's brought up anyway. So, but again, as we're going through these kings, <clears throat> I hope that it kind of resonates. So when you're reading this story, you're like, oh, that was when King Ahaziah was sick and he was inquiring of Baal's above, you know, when this happened. You kind of remember what was the context of why Elijah was sending down fire to begin with. Because the disciples here kind of have a warped view as far as when that's supposed to be going on or why you would send down fire. And so in Luke 9 and verse 53, it says, And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So the backstory here is that they weren't receiving Jesus in this area. And in verse 54, it says, And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Eli- Elias did? So what's he talking about? He's talking about that story that we just read where he took out the 50s, the groups of the captains of the 50s. And why did they want to do that? Well, because they didn't receive Jesus. Okay. Well, now, was that the reason that Elijah called down fire or was it because these guys were trying to kill him? And also, you're dealing with a wicked king that was worshiping Baal. So there's a lot of things that when you know the story and know where this comes from, you can look at this and be like, okay, this is a little different situation. Jesus says to wipe the dust off your feet, not call fire down from heaven. Okay? Now, obviously, God could end up putting fire down from heaven, right? Because he says it's going to be worse for them than in Sodom and Gomorrah, but not right now. You know, when I leave, uh, and I've left some pretty rough places, but I never said, God, I hope fire comes down from heaven right now and demolishes everybody. You know, because it comes down to this. Notice what Jesus says in verse 55. It says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So He's not rebuking Elijah. He's not saying that was bad what Elijah did. Obviously, that was of the Lord. It was fire that came down from God, right? But there's different situations and there's different things to do in different circumstances, right? And that's what he's trying to get across there. And notice that it's James and John that said it. You ever wonder why they were called the Sons of Thunder? (laughs) I don't know if that's why they were called that, okay? But it kind of makes sense. They're the two that were saying, let fire rain down on these people, right? So bow and ergies, right? You know, the, th- the sons of thunder. But uh, going back to 2 Kings chapter 1. Again, as we go through these kings, the big reason, I want you to memorize the list of kings as far as in order, how they reign. But I want you to kind of just have a signifier when you're dealing with each king of what maybe, how that correlates with other passages in the Bible. Because that's going to help you, Right? If you understand where these kings lie, then when you go into the, the minor prophets, for example, and you say, okay, this minor prophet prophesied during these kings, you're like, okay, I'm in this realm. I know where I'm at in the kings, in the book of kings. And so maybe I can go back there and see some information as far as what they're talking about. Or if you're in the New Testament, and you see stuff like this, and you say, well, what was going on? You go back there and you say, okay, Ahaziah was the king. He was a wicked king. This is what's going on. And so... In 2 Kings chapter 1, and verse 17, <clears throat> it says that, obviously, uh, Ahaziah dies of that sickness. Uh, but in verse 17, it says, So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jer- uh, uh, Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Okay, so uh, notice why why is Jehoram, you know, Jehoram's not his son. It's saying that Ahaziah didn't have a son, but Jehoram reigned in his stead. And what we'll see, go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, that Jehoram is the son of Ahab. So what do you have? Ahaziah and Jehoram are brothers. So Ahaziah dies and his brother reigns in his stead. 
Okay, this isn't going to be the only place that this happens where a brother steps in and takes the reign, but it's pretty much either the son reigns in his stead or someone kills the person and reigns in his stead. That's kind of usually the way it goes, um, especially in the kings of Israel. Right, that's where it's like it's it, the son uh, Jeroboam's line is since long gone at this point, and we have different people that are like killing each other, or taking that place. But in first, uh, Second Kings chapter three, there in verse one. It says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not there therefrom. So, Interesting with Jer- Jer- uh, Jehoram is that he's not as bad. Okay, I'm not like giving him a, a, a clean bill of health here. Okay, but notice that he doesn't walk after his father and his mother's sins. He just claved to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So he's kind of like not as bad as the rest. Okay, so here we got to finally a point where okay he's 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 bad, but he's not that bad. Okay, um, this is where it gets confusing when you have these the kings of Israel and kings of Judah because. Remember in 2 Kings, when it's talking about Jehoram, it says Jehoram reigned in the set in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. So there's Jehoram reigning in Judah, and there's a Jehoram reigning in Israel at the same time. Now, you say, well, is that a contradiction? Because in, in this chapter, it says that Jehosh- he reigned over Israel in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. This is where you have co-regency reigning. Okay. And so don't get all uptight when you see this happen because it's basically giving you more information, basically saying that Jehoram, it's basically saying that Jehoram, Jehoshaphat's son, was pretty much kind of helping out his father and reigning at that time. And, and Jehoshaphat was still technically king. But it's kind of like David. You know, David made Solomon king before he died. Does that make sense? But, you know, he, he didn't really... And so he was technically reigning while his father's reigning, but not really, right? He's kind of just in the place until his father dies, and then he steps into the role. And so when you see that type of stuff, that's where you'll see the so-called contradictions in the Bible. It's a lot of times just co-regency, meaning that they're, they're both reigning at the same time. But really, you had the hierarchy that the, obviously Jehoshaphat would have final say. Does that make sense? And so uh, just want to give you that little nugget right there when you're reading through the kings and the chronicles don't get so uptight don't think oh the bible has an error in it um there's answers to all that stuff so um but we see that he is better than than ahaziah and so uh but but jehoram reigns 12 years right he reigns 12 years in samaria now during his reign remember at the, the beginning of uh the second kings it talks about moab rebelling against israel well, it doesn't really get into that until we get to Jehoram, okay? Ahaziah only reigned for two years anyway, so it's not like the big time gap between that anyway. Uh, but go to uh, uh, chapter 3 there and verse 4. Because in chapter 3, we see this whole rebellion of Moab, and it's an interesting story with Jehoram here. Guess who's going to yoke up with them? Jehoshaphat. You know, all these kings right here, we see Jehoshaphat yoking up with them. <clears throat> so in 2 Kings chapter 3, and verse 4, it says, And Mesha, or Mesha, however you want to say that, king of Moab was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and an hundred thousand ram, rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So we see that whole rebelling going on after Ahab dies. And we don't really see Moab doing much about it until we see Jehoram coming on the scene. And so in verse 6 there, it says this. It says, And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel, and he went and sent to Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to, to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. Sounds like it's just it's pretty much exactly what he says to Ahab. So what do we have? Jehoshaphat's helping out Ahab. He's like, oh, you know, we're brethren. You know, I'm as you are. 
Then AI is like, hey, we want to build some ships. And he's like, yeah, let's do this. The business venture with his wicked king, Ahaziah. That turns to naught because God breaks all the ships. But then you have Jehoram saying, hey, Moab's coming against us here. You want to help us out? And he said, I'm as you are. And we see that God rebukes Jehoshaphat for that. Uh, but Elisha now, so we saw Elijah with Ahaziah and that whole saying you're not going to live and all that stuff. But now Elisha is coming on the scene. Because if you know this, the, the uh, First Kings and Second Kings, you have these stories of Elijah and Elisha. And it's kind of like there's these little breaks in between talking about the kings, and you just have these stories with these prophets. Okay, So we've already skipped over the story where Elijah goes up in the whirlwind in chapter 2. So Elijah's now gone. Elisha has a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and that's where we're at in this story. So uh, for sake of time, I didn't want to go through all the stuff about Elijah and Elisha as we go through that. But know this, that Elijah and Elisha are going on. Their, their ministry is during Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, and you know that's the realm of when, where they're at. And so Elisha, in verse 11 there, so 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king, or in the, and one of, the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now, to give you some backstory, we kind of skipped over some verses there. Basically, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom are coming at Moab, and they're at this place where there's no water, and they're basically you know, saying, you know, Moab's going to take us out here. And so that's where Jehoshaphat said, Is there no one to inquire of God here? And so Jehoshaphat's the one stepping up, basically asking about this. Verse 13, it says, And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. I love this. I don't know why. It's just a, a cool thing that he says. He's basically saying, if Jehoshaphat wasn't standing here right now, I wouldn't be looking at you right now. So he's basically regarding, you know, he's basically regard. He's, he, the only reason that he's dealing with the king of Israel and the king of Edom is because of Jehoshaphat, because Jehoshaphat's a righteous king. And we haven't got to Jehoshaphat yet. We're going to get down to the kings of Judah. But Jehoshaphat did right in the eyes of the Lord. And it just, uh, it just it reminds me of thinking about the fact that we're, we're in a wicked nation, but God will help out a nation based off some righteous people in it. And he helps out these kings because of Jehoshaphat. Amen. And so it's just an interesting story to kind of see how one righteous king can turn the tide, even though you got wicked kings in there. And it... I, I just like that phrase. I just like, I like Elisha. He's just, he's just like, I wouldn't even look at you. I wouldn't look at you, Jehoram, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat. He's the only reason I'm here right now. <laughs> and just that attitude of Elisha, I just love it. But, um, so Elisha tells them what to do. So they're in this, this, uh, this predicament where they basically go out to, to go after Moab. But then Moab, you know, basically, they, they run out of water and all this other stuff. And so Elisha is going to tell them what to do. In verse 15, it says, But now bring me a minstrel. And it, and it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. So this is pretty much what he tells them to do. Okay? And he basically just says, Hey, you, know, you need to make this valley full of ditches. Just put a whole bunch of ditches in this valley. Okay? Now he's kind of explained this, but that's pretty much what he tells them to do. That's all they got to do is, Dig up all these ditches, you know, right? Notice in verse 17. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hands. So he's basically saying, dig these ditches, okay? But it's not going to rain. You're not going to see rain. It's going to come from afar. So... Anybody that's probably been in Arizona 
or places like that. But even in West Virginia, it'll rain somewhere. And if you're in a valley, that water will come rushing. And, you know, you get these flash floods, so to speak, and, and you're like, it's a sunny day like this. All of a sudden, boom, you're getting just hammered with water, but it's coming off the mountains, okay? So what's happening here is that God makes it rain probably somewhere else, and then it's all rushing off the mountains, and then it's coming into this valley, right? They're in a valley, okay? But he's saying, that's a light thing. I'm not just going to give you water. I'm also going to deliver the Moabites into your hand. So that's an interesting uh, thing that he says there. Notice in verse 19, And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And, and it came to pass in the morning, when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. So it came true. All right? Basically, it didn't rain. They didn't see anything like that. It's just all of a sudden... Water starts flowing into this valley, and it fills up all these ditches. It's basically red. It's like these, they're just catch basins, right? And this is back before the government can basically stop you from catching rainwater, right? We were just talking about this. I didn't realize. I probably did. I probably heard that before. But, like, you can't, like, can't catch rainwater, you know? It's just ridiculous what the government tries to do. Um, anyway, so God tells them to, the, to, to dig these ditches to catch all this water so they can drink it. Their cattle, all them. But not only that, this is what happens. Notice in verse 21. It says, And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. So you get in the picture? They see all these, they dug all these ditches down there, and there's all this water just sitting in it. But what the Moabites saw, was it looked like blood, the way that the light was hitting it. And you can imagine, imagine this. You say, well, how would it look like blood? Well, think about this. Have you ever had a red morning? You know, the, the, you know red at night, sailor's delight, red in the morning, sailor's warning. And, you know, you could have had this, like, dawn. It was basically, you know, the, the sun's coming up, right? And maybe it just shone this red type of glow to it. But it looked like blood to them. And notice what it says in verse 23. And they said... This is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. So they thought they all killed themselves, right? They got down there to come in after us, but then they got in a fight, and they all just started fighting each other. And now it's just a valley filled with blood. It's basically what they thought they saw, okay? And notice that, as you keep reading there, it says in verse 24, And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites, so that they fled before them, but they went forward, smiting the Moabites even in their country. So they win the battle because obviously they came down thinking like everybody's dead. They come down and they're ready to fight and, you know, catching them off guard, all that stuff. And God does this in so many different ways when it comes to, he sends hornets in. He sends, you know, basically all these different things in to basically catch everybody off guard. And where he wins these, these battles with few number of people, okay? Throughout the Bible, it's like that. But, you know, I, I know personally, I never really thought about this story that much. I never really looked at it. You know, you kind of think of uh, Gideon, you know, those famous stories and what they did. And you think about, like, the, the hornets and all these different things that he sends in there. But have you ever really read this story and thought about, hey, they dug these ditches. God sent water from far off. And then when the Moabites, not only did he, did he give them water to drink, but he made that look like it was blood to fool the Moabites and thinking everybody killed themselves so that they'd come down and win the battle. So it's an interesting story on how God did that. And just think about the knowledge of God. You know, just the, just the, the wisdom and how he allowed that to happen. Who would have ever thought to do that? Think about that. Would you ever thought, hey, we're going to dig some ditches here. We're going to fill it with water and hopefully they think it's blood. <laughs> you know what I mean? But God obviously... You know, when it says God is a man of war, that's a man of war I don't want to mess with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you think of the tactics of God. Obviously, God could just smite you like that. But think of his knowledge and wisdom and the tactics that he has. And you think about all these stories where he wins these battles and just the way he does it. It's just an interesting story on, like, how he ends up winning this battle. Uh, but going on from that, we see that uh, during Jehoram's reign... And again, a lot of this stuff just has to do with what happened during his reign. Uh, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, is besieging Samaria. 
Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the whole story, but this is the story where there's basically this big famine in, in Israel. And I'm going to read some of it. But if you remember the story where there's those four leprous men sitting on the wall, and they're like, well, we're going to die here, we're going to die there, let's at least go to the Syrians and see if, you know, they'll spare us or something like that, right? So it's kind of like, well, we're better off just going over there and getting killed than dying of hunger over here. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And then they go into the camp, and there's no, Assyrian, there's no Syrians there, and they're, like, eating all this food, and they're like, we do not well. And they went back and told Israel that they've the whole fled. Okay, that's that story. This is this story. But what I want to show you is what happened before that deliverance of the Syrians as far as with Jehoram being the king here. And verse, uh, where did I have you turn? I, I, I didn't have you turn anywhere, did I? 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 24. It says, And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a, a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Good night. So what's being said there? Well, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit to you that an ass's head and dove's dung is not something that I want. But they're spending a lot of money for it. <laughs> okay? Four score pieces of silver, that's 80 pieces of silver. Right? 80 pieces of silver for a, an ass's head. So basically to eat whatever's left on the head of an ass. Right? So a donkey's head for 80 pieces of silver and then for five pieces of silver, you can get some doves done. Delicious. What it's showing you here is how bad the famine was. That they were literally eating doves dung to try to survive. That's how bad. And they were being besieged at the same time. So a lot of times, you know, the tactic with war is basically starve them out. They're outside the gate. You can't get in, but you can basically stand out there long enough to where they can't survive. Okay? They didn't have drones back then to drop in food to these people. Okay? Meaning that their way of getting food was outside that, that wall. And, you know, obviously they, they couldn't survive on that. Uh, but going on from that, in verse 26, it says, And as the king of Israel was passing by, now I'm going to get into a very rough passage here, just to forewarn you, okay? And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? out of the barn floor or out of the wine press. So he's basically, this woman's saying, you know, help me. And he's like, how can I help you? We're all in the same spot here. None of us can eat, right? Notice in verse 28. And the king said unto her, what aileth thee? And she answered, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the, the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass, now think about this, she's basically saying, wanting the king to say, no, you need to give your son over so you can eat him. So they turned into cannibals. That's how bad it got during Jehoram's reign. So Jehoram, that's what he goes down for, is being this wicked king that the parents are eating their children that got so bad. And notice what it says in verse 30. It says, And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. So he just rent his clothes. He's just like, what in the world is going on? That's how bad it was. And you say, well, this is just a crazy story. Do you know that this is in the law? This is in Deuteronomy, that this would happen. Jehoram is, the, is fulfilling... Uh, you know, a scripture in Deuteronomy. That's what he goes down for, and it's not a good one. Okay? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Say, good night, this is rough. Well, listen, we need to read the whole Bible. And some of these stories are rough. Judges 19 is one of the roughest stories in the Bible when I read it. But this is also one of those. When I read this story, I'm just like, what in the world? And you're thinking that too. Like, how can anybody ever do that? I would just die. Just, you know, take me out fall upon a sword, I don't know, do something. But how in the world could you eat your own child? 
But notice what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 49. It says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thine kind, thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy, thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt, and notice, now this leads up to this, basically what's going to happen. Okay, so this is a prophecy that's being fulfilled. Through Jer, Jer, Jehoram was king when this is fulfilled. This is not the one I want to be fulfilled if I was king. <clears throat> but notice what happens here. What are they doing? They're eating all their food while they're besieging them. Does that make sense? They don't have any food. So that's why there's this great famine in Samaria. They're being besieged by the, Moab, uh, by the Syrians, I'm sorry, <clears throat> and they don't have any food. Notice in verse 53, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness, wherein thine enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he had, had nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. Notice this, the tender and delicate woman among you. So notice these are two women that came with their children. This is amazing to me. Not amazing good, but just baffling and amazing to think of like a woman with their child that this would actually ever happen. And anybody that was probably reading this law probably thought this will never happen. There's no way this could ever happen. Right? The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. I mean, we're talking a, a soft, delicate woman here that, that's just not a malicious bone in her body, right? Her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children, which, shall, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. You're saying, why are you reading this? Because I want you to see what happens when you don't follow God. And Jehoram is a king that did not follow the Lord, and he, he stuck to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and he, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and look what happened to his kingdom. And you think America is any better than this? Amen. You know, America is, is one of the most wicked nations when it comes to abortion, when it comes to the wickedness that we're trying to propagate throughout the world. Amen. And you don't think that this could happen to us? And listen, it will happen eventually. You know, we may not be here for it because it's going to be Babylon the Great following. But you think about... The, the, this curse that's put upon them. This is Israel. And it baffles me, these Zionists out there that think, well, God will never curse Israel. What in the world are you talking about? Do I need to go back to my lukewarm Christianity sermon where you don't know anything about what the Bible says? How about Jehoram, the, the king of Israel? What about them eating their own children? What about that is a blessing, my friends? And who did it? Now, obviously, the, he sent in a nation that caused it to happen, but that was a curse that was put upon them for their own sins. And so, it's a creepy story, and we're not going to end on that one, okay, but close to it. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, it is interesting how that came true. And there's a lot of things in the law where you read it and you're like, well, what is that talking about? And then there's actually a story where it comes true. And you see those things actually come to be. But, that's just a creepy one. I'm just like, what in the world? It's so creepy. Even Jehoram's just like, oh, what in the world? He just ran his clothes, put on sackcloth. He's like, what in the world is going on? And, you know, starvation will do weird things and to mentally to people. And it, it, these, these women could not be right in the head. 
I'm just going to say that right now. They're either reprobate, which, I mean, is very possible, right? But they're just mentally completely gone. Amen. I mean, insane. You have to be insane to do something like that. No sane person could ever do that, okay? So basically, it's talking about basically that they were driven to insanity to where they're doing crazy stuff like this. And, uh, but going to 2 Kings chapter 9, 2 Kings chapter 9, and we're going to get into Jehu, but this is the story where what happens to Jehoram. Jehoram is killed by Jehu, the son of Nimshi. And so we're going to do a whole sermon on Jehu, but um, Jehoram comes to his demise. You say, man, all these sermons are just like, just bad things happening. Yeah, that's what happens when you don't follow the Lord. And all these kings, you know what You know what these kings, and you say, well, why are we going through all these? Because it's things of not to do. Some of the best lessons are things not to do. You know, learning from other people's mistakes, learning from, you know, if America would read this passage and understand that they need to follow God, maybe they get a little fear of God in them saying, I don't want this to go down that far. I don't want it to be that bad for our country. I don't want the curses of God coming on our country because this is one of them that can happen. And... I definitely don't want to ever see it get that bad. But, you know, uh, you, can't, you can't just turn a blind eye to these type of things. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 14, again, we'll go through the whole story of Jehu and all that, um, but this is where Jehu is coming against uh, Jehoram. Now, notice in verse 14 it says, So Jehu, the son of uh, Je- uh, Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. This is the same Jehoram. It just drops off that E and H there. Now, Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Hazael, king of Syria. But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. And Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come to see Joram. Now, this is where there's a lot of names that are similar, okay? This is where it, gets, it can get confusing, right? Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Jehoshaphat is not the Jehoshaphat of Judah, okay? So this is a different person. Jehu is not the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, okay? So I want to get that across first of all. Uh, we see also that in here we're talking about this is Jehu, the son of Nimshi, is different than Jehu, the son of uh, Hanani, the prophet that we saw earlier. And so we have differences there. Um, and then uh, Ahaziah, king of Judah, is different than the Ahaziah we just got done talking about. You say, well, why is he named Ahaziah? Why, you know, why do they have these similar names? Because he joined affinity. Jehoshaphat joined affinity with the house of Ahab. Jehoram marries uh, uh, Athaliah, which is Ahab's daughter. Now, I said it was Omri's daughter, which it does say in the Bible, but there's another place where it says it's Ahab's daughter. Okay? So, Athaliah and Jehoram are brother and sister, but then Athaliah marries Jehoram of Judah. Okay? Not his brother. Jehoram of Judah. And that's where you get these names. Well, why did they name him Ahaziah? She named him after her brother, Ahaziah. Okay, and so that's where you get these names that are mixing in there. It's because they're, they they kind of join forces there for a little bit, and you get these names that are mixing in there. Uh, but basically, what happens is that Jeho- uh, Jehoram, at the end of his reign, Hazael, who ends up killing Ben Hadad. So Ben Hadad is the one that's besieging Samaria. That's when all that wickedness happens. You know, as far as they're eating their children, all that stuff. That's Ben Hadad. Well, Hazael kills Ben Hadad. And takes over Syria. Now, Hazael is going after, and they're fighting together. And we don't really see much about this, but Jehoram, basically, all it says is that when they're fighting, when he's fighting Hazael, he gets wounded. And he's basically just trying to get healed of his wounds at this point. That's basically what's going on when Jehu comes in. Okay? Notice in verse 24, so 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 24, it says, And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. 
Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of, of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I, I, and I and thou rode together after Ahab, his father, the Lord laid his burden upon him. Surely I, I, I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth, the blood of his sons, saith the, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in, in this plat, saith the Lord. Now, therefore, take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. So, remember when Ahab, when that the whole Naboth, the Jezreelite, and all that stuff, remember that they brought the chariot back and the dogs licked the blood, like he said? Well, he also said that his children were all going to be destroyed. And that's what Jehu does. Jehu cuts off Ahab's house. That's what happens here. So, at this point, you know, all of Ahab is house is destroyed. I, mean, well, I, didn't, I don't think he gets that in this chapter right here, but he's going to kill everybody else. <laughs> okay, He comes back, and uh, spoiler alert, but we'll get to it. Uh, they, he has Jezebel thrown out of the tower and she dies. So everybody, the house of Ahab, Jezebel, all their sons, all of them are going to be destroyed by Jehu. Okay, And so that's the end of Jer- uh, uh, Jehoram. I mean, that's, so what happened to Ahaziah? Ahaziah fell through a lattice in the upper chamber, right? gets sick, dies. He only reigns for two years. Then his brother Jehoram, since Ahaziah didn't have any sons, his, his brother Jehoram steps in. He's not as bad as Ahaziah, but he's still wicked, right? And just crazy stuff that happens. But there is one battle where he, you know, they prevail because of Jehoshaphat, <laughs> okay? You know, you think of Ahab, where Ahab, you know, Ahab at least has that one story where God uses him. And it's more so because they're, like, speaking against God. And God's like, you know what? I'm going to take him out, and you're going to lead the charge. But that was, be- you know, Ahab was leading the charge there. But this story, it's like, it's only because Jehoshaphat was there, let's be honest, Amen. that he allowed this to happen. If Jehoshaphat wasn't there, he probably would have let them all die of thirst over there. And so uh, you had that one story, but then you had that crazy story that happens in Samaria during that famine. That all happens during Jehoram. So that family, Omri, Ahab, then you have Ahaziah and Jehoram that are brothers. Those are the four that are the family members. And at the end of Jehoram, they're all taken out. That whole seed is gone. Okay, so the house of Ahab dies with that. Now, I say that to a certain extent because Athaliah is still in the mix, but she's going to end up dying too. Okay, so that comes later. So while Jehu is reigning, Athaliah is still there, you know, um, but that's going to be taken care of as well. So they're all going to be completely annihilated and taken out. So Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, and Jehoram, the son of Ahab. And just to give you a recap, and again, we're working on a chart to to get together as far as to make it easier visually uh, to where you see the kings of Judah, the kings of Israel, and seeing where they lie and who's reigning because Asa is reigning during a lot of these and then Jehoshaphat is reigning during a lot of these and kind of just seeing it visually. But remember, after Solomon, you had the split, Jeroboam in the northern kingdom and then you had Rehoboam in the southern kingdom. But Jeroboam reigned for 22 years. Nadab, his son, reigned for two years. Then his whole house was taken out. Baasha, who did the taking out, reigned for 24 years. Then his son Elah only reigned for two years, and then his whole house was taken out by Zimri. Zimri reigned for a whopping seven days, one week. Burned the house down over top of him. And then Omri, the captain of the host, takes over, and he reigns for 12 years. Ahab, his son, obviously a very prominent king with the stories here, reigns for 22 years. His son only reigns, his son Ahaziah reigns for two years, and then after he dies, his other son, Jehoram, reigns for 12 years. So that's where we're at right now. So if you can remember that, Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elah, Zimri, put him in there, you know, the guy that burned his house over his, <laughs> over his head, Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram. So I want you to try to remember these, and, you know, write them down. And as we're going through here, just kind of keep remembering who came before this because uh, if you get anything out of this, and hopefully you get something other than that, than the, just remembering that, but memorize the line of the kings because I believe it'll help you when you're studying the Bible. So let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today and just pray that you be with us as we uh, uh, have some fellowship after this, but also as we go back to work throughout this week. 
And Lord, just pray that you would uh, uh, bless those that, that came in from far and just pray that you be with them in their travels. And Lord, uh, I pray also that you be with the Ford family that, that has been uh, trying to move in and all that stuff. I just pray that you be with them uh, as they're uh, trying to get settled in. But also just pray that you be with, uh, be with Mountain Baptist Church. Thank you for the souls that were saved today. And Lord, we love you and pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.